This morning, as I've already told you on more than one occasion, uh, we're looking at uh, the account of the woman caught in adultery. And we find that in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And I'd like to uh, read that for you now as we begin. John chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 1. Again, let's remember that this is the Word of God. So let's pay careful attention to it. Now we've, we've learned that the Feast of Booths just ended. We read in verse 53 that everyone went to his home. But we read in verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. And when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman, where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding, our hearing this morning. What is the one thing that, um, that we always want others to show us, but we have a difficult time showing to others? Uh, isn't it what we're reading about here? Isn't it uh, mercy? Uh, we don't want others to point out our flaws and our weaknesses, but we often point them out in others, sometimes with a little measure of delight, perhaps. Uh, we, we want others to forgive us when we sin against them, but we often want justice for those who sin against us. We want God to be merciful to us, but we often don't want him to be merciful to others, especially if they've offended us in some way. Now, I'm not saying we do that all the time, but we all have some disposition towards that because that's part of, um, well, the result of the fall. But the question we need to ask is this. Is, is this how the Lord wants us to be? Well, obviously not. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be one who delights in showing mercy. That is what he is like. And he wants us to do the same. Now, it's easy to show mercy to somebody who hasn't sinned against you, but he wants us, as you know, to love even our enemies. Now, this morning we see that after the Feast of Booze that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and returned again in, uh, to the temple early in the morning. Uh, as he was teaching the people, the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They reminded him what Moses required, which was the death penalty. And they asked what he thought. Now John tells us the reason they did this was they were trying to trap him. Would he side with Moses, uh, giving them the opportunity to call Jesus a hypocrite since he had declared himself to be the friend of tax gatherers and sinners? Or would he side against Moses and show her mercy, showing that he was actually against God's law? They basically thought they had Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. Now what we want to see this morning is that Jesus shows her mercy, but he does it in a way that does not violate his Father's law. We want to see that the Lord delights in showing mercy. Uh, you know, sometimes we, I think, picture God as, especially when we read the Old Testament, as seeing, being somebody who's easily angered. And, you know, he does certainly insist on perfect obedience, but we seem to think that if we just step out of line, he's ready to, you know, just um, 
come down on us like a hammer. But we do need to understand as we look at our own lives and the fact that we're here, that's not the way God is. God is merciful. And that is good for us because we need mercy. Without it, we would be lost. But of course, that's what we want to see this morning as we consider this text. But the other thing I want us to bear in mind as we go through this particular section is that God also delights in those who are willing to show mercy as He does. Now that's what we're going to be focusing on this morning, but I, or this evening, but I want us to be reminded first of this example because this is the example we are to follow. Now this morning let's consider three things. Let's consider the woman's sin. Let's consider the Jews' plot. And let's consider the Lord's mercy. So first of all, let's consider this woman's sin. John writes in verses 3 and 4 of our text, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery, in the very act. Now, in other words, there's no question she was guilty. Now, let's think about the context of this particular uh, event, because we do believe this was just simply the next day after the Feast of Booths. It's likely that the adultery that is being referred to here actually took place at the Feast of Booths, which, as I've already mentioned, ended just the day before. Uh, you recall that this feast was one of the three feasts that brought all the Jews together from all over the Roman Empire. And during the eight days of the feast, the Jews were all living in the, basically these makeshift um, huts, these lean-tos. Now, with so many attending the feast, there were a lot of Jews, the huts were undoubtedly placed close together. And when you add to this the fact that it was a time of feasting and rejoicing and perhaps the wine was flowing a bit more than it might usually, and that there were many, many more men than women at that particular time because only the Jewish men were required to attend the feast, which means that many of the men didn't have their wives with them. When you consider that no one was working, I mean, this was a feast. All these people from out of town. Uh, you add all these things together and you see that there was the very real possibility of falling into temptation. And here was a woman who had fallen into it. Not just a woman, but also a man. Now, we always need to be on our guard against temptation because we know our flesh, we know the world, we know the devil and his demons are always going to be working to get us to fall. But we especially need to be on our guard when we have nothing to do. Although I don't know how often that occurs for most of us here, having nothing to do. But ideally, we should never be idle. We should always be doing something. We should always have a purpose. We should always be striving towards a particular goal. Now, I'm not saying that we need to be workaholics and never take a break and never rest because that is not what the Bible teaches us. We need rest. But rest is not being idle. Rest is doing something, doing something positive. Taking time out to be refreshed. Preparing ourselves to be able to pursue our goals with even greater energy. What I'm really saying here is that we should never allow ourselves to be in a position where we are not pursuing something. And of course, as Christians, there's something we are always to be pursuing. And that is Christ likeness. And we're not going to find it by being idle. You see, when we're pushing forward, when we're pursuing that goal, it's going to be much harder for our flesh to divert us. It's going to be much harder for Satan to try to move us off course. It's going to be harder for the world to drag us down if we are pursuing Christ's likeness, if we are following the example that has been given to us by Christ, if we are following the example that Paul gave to us from his, his, again, his own experience. Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14. This is what Paul writes. Not that I have already obtained it, that is, of course, perfection, Christ-likeness, or that for which Christ uh, redeemed him and called him, or have already become perfect. But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. 
Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I submit to you that that is an example of what the Lord wants us to be doing. How is it that Paul was able to accomplish as much as he did? It's because he wasn't idle but he was always pursuing that for which the Lord called him, and that's what we need to be doing. And when you're doing that, you're going to be much, much less likely to fall into any sin. So it's a safeguard for us to continually be pushing ahead. Now this woman and the man she was with weren't pursuing this goal, quite obviously, or if they had, they, they at least lapsed and weren't pursuing it at that very moment. And so they fell into sin. They were caught in the very act of adultery. Someone must have been passing by, saw them in the hut, recognized them. Um, considering that they brought the woman to Jesus in order to accuse her publicly in this way, there were at least two that saw her committing this crime. Now here was this woman caught in adultery. And the one question that's often asked is, why wasn't the man brought along with the woman? And there's a lot of conjectures to exactly why that would be the case, but we don't really know. There was no good reason for not bringing him. If a man and a woman were caught in adultery, they were both equally guilty and they both needed to be charged, not just the woman. Now another question we need to ask is this, how serious is adultery? I mean, our culture has, has actually made it to be something that we, we dismiss as sort of like this is the norm. It's easy to lose sight of the fact in our culture that it's even wrong. I mean, today, fornication, adultery, they're portrayed almost as virtuous, almost as what's expected to take place. I mean, particularly fornication, certainly in our culture, and sadly, even in the church. There's hardly anyone who escapes falling into this snare. So we do need to remind ourselves this morning what God actually says about sexual sin, what he says about adultery. Fornication is something in Scripture that generally requires those who are involved in it to get married. I mean, we, we kind of chuckle at that, but that's what the Bible requires. But what about adultery? Well, the Jews reminded Jesus what the penalty was for adultery in verse 5. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. We should also include men. And you know what? They were right, because that's exactly what the law required. We read in Leviticus 20, verse 10, If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. It's not something, again, that we see in our culture, but where's the fear of God there? Well, there is no fear of God, but this is what God requires. And then we read in Deuteronomy 22, 22, If a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. Thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. What does adultery deserve? God required capital punishment for adultery. Now here's an interesting question. What does adultery deserve today? Is, is the, basically the penalty the same or is it changed? Well, we need to ask ourselves this question. Is there any reason to believe from reading the scriptures that God's mind has changed on this matter? Again, this is a difficult question. Has his justice changed? Is, is it a sliding scale that basically adjusts to the culture so that, you know, whatever is tolerated in the culture becomes God's will? Well, that's relativism, isn't that? Um, you know, that's, that's not what the Bible teaches us. We would have to say the God who doesn't change, if he tells us that this is what that crime deserves, we have to believe it's still required. It still deserves capital punishment. It is a serious sin. One that we should avoid at all costs as a safeguard to keep us falling into it. 
you know, by pulling back all of these penalties for various crimes, it just makes it so people aren't afraid to commit the crimes anymore. This is a safeguard to keep us from doing those things. Now, the women, excuse me, the woman and the man must have known what the penalty was, but they still fell into this sin. And now, just speaking of the woman, she deserved death. Now, one thing we do have to be careful about here is in case we feel like, you know, we feel the urge to kind of rise up and condemn this woman for being such a sinner. Let's not forget that really all of us here deserve capital punishment, not in the same sense. I mean, there were certain crimes that people committed in Israel that weren't capital crimes, and there were capital crimes. But in the court of God's law, as it were, we deserve capital punishment. All of us do. We all deserve to die. And why is that? Well, because we're all guilty. Outside of Christ, I mean. You know, we all came into this world guilty of a crime that God said deserved death. We all ate from a tree which God commanded us not to eat from, the penalty of which was death. I mean, God said to Adam in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Now, you know as well as I do that we weren't in the garden and we didn't eat from that tree personally, but we did eat from it representatively. Paul writes in Romans 5 verse 12, Through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. And verse 18, through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. Adam sinned. He, he was our representative. The crime that he committed, the sin that he committed is charged to our account so that we are just as guilty as if we were in the garden and had eaten of that tree ourselves. If we had, as though we had disobeyed God and committed cosmic rebellion. And let's not forget, that's not the only sin we've committed. We've committed many more since we have come into the world, many, many more, each one of which deserves death. Paul writes in Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we do need to be careful here as far as rising up to be the judges of this woman because we all deserve death apart from God's grace. That becomes particularly important this evening when we see why we should show mercy to others, right? Now secondly, we see the Jews' plot. The real reason they brought her to Jesus and they didn't just carry out the sentence themselves was because they wanted to trap him. They said in verse 5, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman, what, women. What then do you say? And John writes in verse 6, they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. Now if this had been an honest question, I don't think there would have been anything wrong in asking it. In essence, they would be saying this. Now that Messiah is here, what's changed? Has anything changed with regard to to the penalty for this particular crime? But you see, this wasn't an honest question, and so Jesus didn't directly answer that question. Now, how could they use this to trap him? Well, if Jesus had sided with Moses and said that she should be executed, you're right, stone her, then they could have accused him of being inconsistent with himself. After all, he was the friend of tax gatherers sinners or prostitutes. He was known as the friend of sinners. Are you not going to befriend this woman? Aren't you going to stand up for her if you insist on what Moses requires? They could have accused him of being inconsistent with what Messiah was supposed to be when he comes into the world. One who is meek. One who is bearing salvation. One who came to forgive sins. Where's your forgiveness, Messiah? Are you going to insist on the death penalty? And, of course, they could have also accused him to the Roman officials. If they're saying that the Jews should execute this woman outside of their jurisdiction. And you know, 
the Pharisees and the scribes would have done exactly that. But what if he acquitted her? What if he said, well, she shouldn't be stoned? Well, then they could charge him with openly opposing the law of Moses, which clearly says that such should be stoned. Then he would be contradicting himself again when he said that he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, but he came to fulfill them. And that he, they could also accuse him of being more than just a friend to sinners, but he was somebody who favored sin. So basically they thought they had Jesus stuck on the horns of a dilemma. So what did Jesus do? Well, as I mentioned before, Jesus was able to show mercy and he did not violate the law of Moses, nor did he get caught in their snare. After they asked him this question, John writes in verse 6, Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Now, what did Jesus write? <laughs> well, you know, it's not recorded in here, so we really have no idea. I mean, it could have been simply that Jesus was grieved by the question. He knew what they were trying to do. And so he, he didn't want to answer them. He was simply reluctant to answer. But when they insisted, he stood up and said in verse 7, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Anybody guiltless here? Go ahead, stand up, throw a stone. Let's, let's stone her. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? Again, there's a lot of speculation on exactly what he meant. Jesus could not have meant that whoever here is completely sinless, you don't have any sins, you should be the first to execute the sentence because if he had meant that, he would have undermined the whole Old Testament judicial system which required that people be stoned on occasions for their crimes. If it required a sinless person to do it, you could never have carried it out. It would have been unjust for anyone to do it. You see, no one could be punished on those terms. It's more likely he meant this. If there was anyone there who hadn't committed some sin, maybe not necessarily physical adultery like this woman committed, but some sin that deserved the same penalty, that they should be the first to throw the stone. By the way, this would be a good time to just sort of pause and think about, have you ever committed a crime that the Lord says deserves capital punishment? Have you ever cursed father or mother? Have you ever broken the Sabbath? There was a man who was stoned to death for picking up sticks on the Sabbath because he wanted to kindle a fire. Have you ever committed crimes like that? Have you ever blasphemed God in the history of your, your life and your thoughts, maybe? Um, have you ever not? Well, again, there, there's many things we could have, could have done. Okay. Was there anyone there that fit the bill who could say, I haven't, I don't deserve death, stand up and throw the stone? Apparently, there wasn't. After he said this, we read in verses 8 and 9, when they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Now, is this always going to be the case? Is, is everyone there always going to be such that they could not throw the stone again? It would undermine, I think, what was going on in the Old Testament judicial system. But consider these people and what they had done. I mean, what had they done? What, what were these people guilty of? Well, we don't know specifically what they may have been guilty of, but we do know how Jesus characterized them and that whole generation. In Matthew 12, verse 39, he calls them an evil and adulterous generation. Now, does that mean they all committed uh, infidelity in their marriages? Not necessarily. They may not have committed physical adultery, but they did at least commit spiritual adultery. They loved money. They loved the praise of men. They liked being called teacher and rabbi. They loved the power and the position they had with the Roman government. And they loved all these things more than they loved God. Remember what happened when Jesus was casting out demons. They knew this was the Messiah. They knew only Messiah could do this. They knew it had to be the Spirit of God by which he did these things. But they still accused him of being in league with the devil because they loved their power and their position more than they loved God. They were spiritual adulterers. 
That is a very serious sin. As a matter of fact, idolatry is another capital offense in Scripture, as well as all the other sins that go into this. Not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You know, whatever you love more than God is your God. And having another God is committing spiritual adultery. And that is a capital crime. Now, okay, so yes, they were guilty, and yes, their conscience convicted them, and you notice it was the older ones who went out first. I guess they were more willing to, to admit to themselves. There was more water under the bridge. They understood their sins more. But they were all convicted. They all left. And now that they are all gone, Jesus shows mercy. Jesus acquits her. We read in verses 10 and 11, straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Now, again, was Jesus setting aside the judicial law? Was he telling us that this sin no longer requires capital punishment? Was he basically saying that no crime should be punished? I mean, the way that our society seems to be working today. No, that's not what he was saying. But what he was saying here is that there were no longer grounds to accuse her. The law requires witnesses if someone is going to be prosecuted. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 and 7, on the evidence of two witnesses or three witnesses, he who is to die shall be put to death. He shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be the first against him, to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. You see, I don't think we should say that Jesus was necessarily setting aside the judicial law when he said this because what he was doing was following the law. The witnesses were gone. Nobody left to accuse her. Nobody left to pick up the stone and throw it at her because they were the ones who were supposed to be the first to do this. So basically, Jesus was following the law when he, when he did what he did. But now, what about the fact that Jesus knew for a fact she had committed the crime, but he didn't condemn her? Well, this is where mercy comes in, I think. What did she deserve? She deserved justice. She deserved the death penalty. But what did he give her? He didn't give her what she deserved. He didn't give her the death penalty, but he showed mercy. He said, I do not condemn you either. Now, why didn't he condemn her? Well, he is the Messiah. <laughs> he came to grant forgiveness, to show mercy. He could see that she was repentant. He had, I think she had to be repentant in order for him to say this to her, I do not condemn you. But notice that Jesus also expected her to show that she truly was repentant. He says from now on, she was to live as someone who truly was forgiven. From now on, she was to sin no more. And that's exactly what the Lord calls us to do, having received his mercy. I've cleansed you of that filth and of that guilt, so don't walk in it any longer, but walk as those who have been set free from sin. Now here we see the mercy that God has towards sinners in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness. Free forgiveness, full forgiveness, even for the worst of sinners, even for those worse than, what this, you know, than this woman and, and the situation she was in. Now I mentioned just a bit earlier that we shouldn't be too harsh in condemning this woman because we, like the Jews who condemned her, have also committed crimes that deserve Death. Now, maybe not in our courts of law and maybe not even in the Old Testament courts of law, but certainly in God's courts, all of us have sinned, Paul writes in Romans 3.23 again. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And again, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. We have all sinned. We all deserve to die. As a matter of fact, 
you know, we deserve to die physically. And the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The reason why we grow old and die is because we deserve to grow old and die. But we also deserve hell for our sins. We deserve God's justice. We deserve his wrath. That is the only thing that is just for what we have done. But the Lord is willing to forgive us as, as he forgave the woman if we are willing to turn away from our sins, if we are willing to trust Jesus to make us right with God, if we're willing to come to him, he will forgive us. Now, how do we know that? Well, it's shot through Scripture. It's what the gospel is all about. But we have a great example in Scripture of a man who hated Christ, hated him so much he made it his life's goal to do as much harm as he could to him to try to destroy his people, to destroy his church, and he actually did destroy more than a few. But the Lord had mercy on him so that he might use him as an example for us of what he is willing to do for us if we will turn from our sins and trust in him. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 and 16, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. God had mercy on Paul so that we would know of his willingness to show mercy to us. He forgave him, he will forgive us as well. So, will the Lord forgive you of your sins? Is it still possible for you to go to heaven if you haven't yet trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, it is possible. Yes, he is willing to forgive if you are willing to turn away from your disobedience and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to make you right with God. Now, how can you know that you have trusted him and that your sins are forgiven? How can you know that that's true of you? I mean, we know it's true. God says he's willing to do this. But we know people struggle all the time with assurance. How do I know he's done it for me? Well, there is a way you can know. There's at least two ways you can know. You can know that he has, if you love him, and you want to live the kind of life he calls you to live, if... As he told the woman, you go and sin no more. See, if you're willing to do that, then you can know the Lord has forgiven you. But the other is what we're going to look at this evening. You can know that you have received the Lord's mercy when you are willing to show mercy to others. If you aren't willing to show mercy, God is not willing to show mercy to you. He hasn't shown mercy to you. But if you are, then he has shown you mercy. So I would encourage you to return this evening as we consider this particular virtue. Again, not just as evidence that you've been forgiven, but it is a virtue that the Lord particularly delights in when we show compassion and mercy to others as we have received the compassion and mercy of the Lord. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment in prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us apply what he said to us this morning.